Hi folks, uh, welcome to my desired state configuration presentation. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, I am Jess Pomfret. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm a database engineer and an open source contributor. I've contributed to DBA tools, DBA checks, and a couple of uh, resources for the SQL Server DSC module. Uh, apart from technology, my passions are CrossFit and proper football. And the most important thing on this slide is my contact details. If you have questions after the session or you want to get in contact with me, uh, please feel free to reach out either on email or find me on Twitter. So the agenda for today's session is going to be broken down into two main sections. First of all, we'll cover off what desired state configuration is, uh, why we might use it, and then how we use it. And then the second part of that will be putting that uh, into practice to install and configure SQL Server using desired state configuration. So before we get into desired state configuration, I just want to cover off infrastructure as code and what that is. So DSC or desired state configuration gives us a framework to enable infrastructure as code. Um, infrastructure as code is basically this idea of describing our infrastructure in code. So for example, I have a VM and I've got a code file that says exactly how to build that VM. Two CPUs, eight gigs of RAM. This is the OS. This is the file system layout. This is how SQL Server should be configured. Since we've now defined that VM uh, in code, we can keep that in source control. When we then go to deploy that uh, infrastructure into our environment, it will be uh, built. There'll be some testing to ensure everything's working as expected. And then any changes can be, uh, can be released automatically using this pipeline. There are many benefits of infrastructure as code. Uh, first of all, it's repeatable, right? If I check my uh, changes into source control and then I know that this pipeline is going to do the exact same thing every time, I get pretty comfortable that I know what kind of changes I'm making and how that's going to affect my environment. It's also easier to promote things through environment this way. I can make my changes to development, test them out, promote them to test, promote them to uh, stage, and then into production. We can also think about security here. I no longer need the really uh, high level permissions in our production environment because the, the little release automation robot is doing the work rather than my personal account. On the flip side of that, if we're using infrastructure as code, this, this pipeline really holds the keys to our kingdom. So it's important that we make sure that, sec that security is a priority and that we've locked down everything that we can. Now, infrastructure as code is kind of an organizational culture, right? We can't just say, I heard this thing at a presentation, we're going to do infrastructure as code. The best way to do this is to find a small project, uh, run it kind of as a proof of concept, work through your pipeline and how it's going to work, and then kind of expand on it from there. So desired state configuration was first released in WMF 4.0. It's actually been around for quite a while now. It was greatly enhanced uh, with the 5.1 release. Uh, so if you are running older servers, I would recommend upgrading that. In the future, we're also going to have further enhancements with DSC for PowerShell 7. And we'll talk about that right at the end of this presentation as to what we think that's going to look like. So desired state configuration, it's written in PowerShell. It's going to look pretty pretty familiar to people who are familiar with PowerShell, but it is a domain specific language. And what that means is we have our own domain of terminology and patterns to describe things specific to desired state configuration. Some other DSL examples would be HTML, CSS, or Pester, if you use Pester for testing in PowerShell. Now, with desired state configuration, we're going to have this idea of creating configurations that des describe the desired state of our configuration. And there are really four stages of DSC. And this is, going to how, this is how we're going to think about things today and how we're going to walk through the rest of this presentation. So we have the authoring stage, which is where we're going to write our configurations describing our desired, desired state of our environment. We're then going to publish those uh, configurations out to our target nodes. That'll be enacted, or which is the make it so phase. And then finally, we'll monitor, making sure that our environment is staying in the desired state and that we're not experiencing any configuration drift. So let's get right to it. Step one, authoring. How do we write our first DSC configuration? So usually when we write PowerShell, most of our PowerShell scripts are going to be imperative, which means we're going to describe or explain the exact steps we want uh, to run to, create, to complete our tasks. The top half of this slide, you can see that I'm using new item to create a directory at c, uh, c temp. 
That's perfect, right? It's going to create the directory at that location. No problems. Just one line of code. The, uh, the bottom half of the slide is a more declarative syntax and is what's we, what we would use within to use DSC. And that is to describe our desired state. So I'm using a file resource and we'll cover that in a second, what the resources are. And I'm saying the exact same thing, right? C temp should be present and it should be a directory. The difference is I'm saying what the desired end state should be. There should be a directory at C temp. I'm not saying create a directory at C temp. If I run the imperative script over and over again, the first time it will work perfectly. The second time it will get a sea of red because the directory already exists. With the declarative syntax, we can run that again and again, and the error handling is built into DSC. So if I run that and the directory already exists, it's in the desired state, so the test will pass and we won't try and create the directory again. Now that gives us the idea of, of idempotence or being idempotent which means that we can rerun that configuration over and over again, and it will end up in the same end state. Uh, it covers the error handling, as I mentioned, and you can now make uh, incremental changes to your configuration and deploy those out to your environment. So resources. This is what I mentioned a minute ago. This is really the building blocks of our configuration. Every piece of our environment that we want to describe, we're going to use a resource block to target. Now, there are two main types of resources, script-based and class-based. Current state of desired state, uh, the current state of the desired state configuration is that the majority of community resources are script-based. Going forward, those are going to change over to class-based as it removes a dependency on, on MOF, which is a goal uh, for PowerShell 7. Also, you can write your own resources. There's plenty of resources available. Um, they are packaged up as modules and are available on the PowerShell gallery. But if you have something specific that is uh, specific to your environment, you can write your own resources for it and build and build those in. So let's dive into the demos and have a look at the resources we have available. So I'm here on my VM, and we're going to take a look at some resources. So get DSC resource is very similar to get command for functions in PowerShell. It is going to go and look at all of the resources I have available in the module PS desired state configuration and return a list of things that I can use. So you can see the file resource that I mentioned earlier. We've got environment. We've got uh, registry to be able to update registry keys. We've got services. Uh, we've got Windows features. All of these are available built into any Windows server. We can also use get DSC resource and pass in the syntax parameter for a specific resource, and it will tell us exactly how to use that. So if I pull this up just a second as that's running, And you can see that the syntax has been returned here. So we're going to say that it's a file uh, resource. We need to give it a string for the resource name. And then these are all of the parameters or properties that we can set to, uh, desire, to configure our desired state. Destination path, which is where that file or folder will be. We have type to determine whether it's a directory or a file. And there are some other things in here too, like attributes. Uh, if it is a file, you can pipe some contents into it here. Now, if I run this, get DSC resource, I'm just looking at the service uh, resource at this point, and I'm selecting all of the properties. You can see that the path comes back. It's actually a PSM1 file. As I mentioned, resources are all packaged up as modules. And if we dive into code and just open up that PSM1, you can see that it looks a lot like PowerShell. Now, at the top of this file, we've got some localization data, but then we have three main functions in every, power, in every DSC resource. Uh, for script based, they will look like this get target resource, test target resource, and set target resource. And under the covers of all script based DSC resources, this is exactly the code you'll find in those three blocks. Finally, since I mentioned uh, there are plenty of resources available on the PowerShell gallery, in this case, I'm using find DSC resource, which is similar to find module, to go out to the PowerShell gallery and find a specific resource, in this case, SQL setup. Uh, you can see that this is available in the SQL Server DSC module, the version and the repository that it's currently on, PS Gallery. You can use wildcards. I know exactly the resource that I wanted to look up in this example, which is why I put the full name in. Uh, but this is a good way to explore what is available. So let's go back to my PowerPoint. Okay, so 
as I mentioned, the resources are in modules and there's so many available. The last time I did a count of how many resources are currently available was earlier this week and there was 1800 different resources available on the gallery. The first uh, box on this screen is the PS Desired State Configuration Resources. Those are the ones that are built in uh, in that module we've already looked at. There is a PSDSC Resources module that tacks on top of these and overwrites some of those and also includes a couple of composite resources that are at the bottom of that box. The SQL Server DSC module is the one we're going to use uh, specifically for configuring, uh, installing and configuring SQL Server. Uh, there are currently 41 resources in that module, including the ones you can see here. For So AG for uh, setting up your availability groups, database, database owner, SQL Server login, SQL setup, which is the installation one. Finally on here, I've got Security Policy DSC. This is just another resource or just another module I wanted to highlight. This is a wrapper around SecEdit, so you can actually use it to configure local security policies. Uh, for example, perform volume maintenance tasks, lock pages in memory, etc. So now we know about resources, which are our building blocks. What we need to do now is to plug those into our configuration and learn how to really write our first configuration. So this is what a, a really simple but um, syntactically correct uh, configuration looks like. So configuration is a specific, specific type of PowerShell function. I've given it a name here, create SQL folders, the same as if you were creating a function. Within that, we're going to use import DSC resource. Um, to bring in any resources that we're going to need in our configuration. In this example, I'm only using one module, but I could have multiple mod modules listed here. Underneath that, we have a node block. Now, we can have one or many node blocks within our configuration, and you can have one or many, uh, and, that, and this is going to target one or many servers. Uh, if you pass in an array, you can hit multiple servers at once. Within each node block, we'll have our resource blocks. Here you can see I've hit that file resource again. That needs to be named and the name needs to be unique within your configuration. The name is also pretty important because in the troubleshooting, that's the name that's going to be returned. Uh, so we need to make sure that we know what that is. And then on, after inside that resource block is where we have our, our properties and where we configure what our desired state looks like. In this case, my C SQL 2017 SQL data folder. So when we run that, uh, it creates a configuration, and when we compile that, we'll end up with a MOF file. The MOF file is uh, what is delivered to the target node to be enacted. You should get one MOF per, or you will get one MOF file per node. I have put in brackets, there's a uh, edge case for partial configurations. The more I read about those, people tend to shy away from them, so just know that they exist, but for most DSC, we're going to have one MOF per node. And since they're item potent, those MOF files can be modified and reapplied uh, to make incremental changes. So let's take a look at our first uh, simple configuration and how we can create a MOF file from that. So if we come in here and take a look, this configuration should look really sim similar to what we've already seen on the slide. I've got my configuration keyword and the name SQL Cert, create SQL folder. I'm bringing in my resources. I've got a node block that's going to target two servers. And then I've just got two file resource blocks, one to create a data folder and one to create a logs folder. So we'll go ahead and run this. And as you see, not much happens, right? It's the same as when you run uh, a function block. You don't actually call the function. It's just ready to be used now. And we can see that by looking at get command, the command type configuration. Here's my create SQL folder. Uh, and these are some composite resources that I mentioned earlier on. When we're ready to call that and actually generate our MOF files, we'll call create SQL folder. There are some common parameters on configurations, including output, and that is where the MOF files will go. So you'll see I've got two MOF files that have been created. And we can have a look at these over here. You can pretty much make out what's going on, but they're not very human readable, and it's not recommended that you edit these. But here you can see I've got my file resource and some destination path information and my file uh, to create my log directory also. So that's clean, that's clean that up. That was our first simple configuration. And that was a pretty simple example for how to create, how to write a really simple configuration. Obviously, in the real world, our configurations could get really detailed and really long. So they've got two enhancements uh, that we're going to take a look at to make our co configurations more real world ready 
The first example is, or the first enhancement is configuration data. Now the idea here is to separate the data from our files from the actual configuration. What we'll, we'll take that data and we'll put it into a, a hash table, uh, like the example in the bottom right hand corner. And that'll be passed back into our configuration using the configuration data common parameter. For this example, we can now use the same configuration for every environment, right? And the only thing changing will be our configuration data, the actual stuff that we pass into the configuration. And since the configuration is written in PowerShell, we can use PowerShell to control how it handles that data and different things can happen based on that configuration data. So the hash table needs to be structured in a certain way. It needs to have an all nodes key that has to be present. But after that, it can have any other number of keys uh, and you can target those just as you would any PowerShell hash table. So let's take a look at enhancing that first configuration and separating the data out from the actual configuration code. Let's close this one and open my configuration and my configuration data. OK, so configuration data. This is a PSD1 file. Uh, that way we have a separate file. It can be a hash table in the same file, but uh, it makes sense to separate them for source control. Here's my all, all nodes uh, key. And you can see I've defined one node, DSC server one, and I've given it an environment of test. After we have our all nodes, we're free to cre create any kind of uh, data underneath that. So I've got non-node data just to specify the data directories for three uh, directories. If we come back to our configuration, it should look very similar to what we just saw a second ago. The main difference here is that I'm now using the all nodes hash table that's created. And any, any node within that all nodes hash table will get these resources. So a, a resource to create the data directory. And here you can see I'm using the full configuration data to be able to get to my non-node data to pull in the data directory. Again, for the log directory. Here's a second node block. As I mentioned, you can have multiple node blocks within your configuration. This time I'm saying, give me all nodes, but where the environment is equal to test. So I'm using some PowerShell here to to only create this test directory if the environment is test. So now when I run this configuration, and let's do that. We'll again create that configuration. It's still called create SQL folder. And when I run that, I'll not only give it the output folder, but I'll also give it the configuration data from that PSD1 file. And what you'll see is I got one configuration or one MOF file created. If we take a look at that, you can see I've got my file create data directory. I've got my file create log directory. And then since this was a test direct test server, I've got my create test directory also. As I've worked through my uh, through my project and I'm ready to deploy this to production, I can go ahead and take this and add in a second node. I'll call this DSC server two, and it will be a production server. I'll save that. Now, all I've done is change the configuration data, which means that I don't have to recompile my configuration and I can just rerun this with the configuration data. Now you can see I've got two more files created. And if I take a look at the second one, remember we defined it as production. I've got my data directory, I've got my log directory, and that's the end. Because this was a production uh, node that I created, the configuration didn't add that test folder, which is pretty cool. It's a good way of, uh, being able to control that configuration for different environments. So that was enhancement one, separating the configuration data away from the code and then being able to, to, uh, to use the same configuration for different environments. The second enhancement we're gonna talk about is composite resources. So as I mentioned, our real world configurations can get really long and complex. What we can do is we can break those down into chunks and those become composite resources. So basically we take a configuration and create that into a composite resource that we can then call from other configurations. So these support parameters, which will basically become the properties of our resource. And you can use PSDSC run as credential, which means you can run it under a different credential. Uh, usually DSC will run under the system account. So let's dive back in and look at how we can enhance this using composite resources. So remember our create SQL folder. This was our really simple configuration. To make this into co to a composite resource, all we'll basically do is copy this and remove the node block. 
if I take a look over here under composite resources, uh, this, fault, this file structure is pretty specific, um, but I'll put this example, it's already up on my GitHub. You'll have a PSM1 file, which basically looks like a configuration. It's called configuration, and then the name of my composite resource, JP SQL folder structure. I've got a number of parameters that again will become our resource properties, importing the resources. And then I've just got some PowerShell to check if that has been passed in. And if it is, if it is I will create a installed directory. I've got several of these for all of the potential different files that we may need to create, folders we may need to create for a SQL installation. Then our main configuration will just call that composite resource. So you can see here, I've got my configuration. I'm pulling in both the PS desired state configuration and my composite resources module, which is this folder here. I've got my nodes, and then I'm just calling JP folder structure and passing in the certain paths I want to set. You can see that that makes it a lot simpler. And if I had six files or six folders to create, I would just have six properties instead of six file resources. Let's check this. You can see my create SQL folder, which is the configuration I just created. And you can also see that JP SQL folder structure is actually in here also. If I run this, I should get my two MOF files still. There we go. And when we take a look at these, they look almost the same. But you can see my file create SQL data is now because of JP SQL folder structure. So it's kind of built on top of those two uh, two configuration levels. But this is just another way of making our, our configurations, uh, we're br breaking it down into chunks and making it more realistic for the real world. And as I mentioned, the parameters can be used to control the behavior of those composite resources. So now we've written our configuration, the next step is to publish it. We have our MOF file, and it's now about how we get our MOF file to our target node. Now, there are two modes for DSC, push and pull. With push uh, mode, we're going to use start DSC configuration to push that configuration from our authoring station out to the target node, where it will be enacted immediately. The other option is uh, a pull mode, where you create yourself a pull server, either using a local service, an SMB share, or Azure Automation. You put your configurations and modules on that pull server, and then you, uh, in, you connect your target node, register that to the pull server. The target node will then check every so often and see if there's a new configuration on the pull server to pull down and configure. We're going to mainly focus with, focus with push configurations today, as it's the easiest way to demo. We're going to use start DSC configuration. What that will do is it will deliver the configuration to the node and immediately make it so. You can see the the uh, uh, the function call at the bottom of the screen, start DSC configuration, giving it the path where your MOF files are and the computer you want to target. I'm using wait and verbose because if you don't do that, it'll run as a background PowerShell job, but this allows us to see exactly what's running. The other option is publish DSC configuration. And what this will do is it will push that uh, MOF file out to the target node, but it will wait until the local configuration manager runs its uh, checks every 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, that can be configured, and then it will be applied. Then we have step three, which is the enact phase. This is the make it so, or where the magic happens. So this is all uh, done using the local configuration manager. That is like the engine of DSC, and it runs on every target node. It's built into Windows Server. The job of the uh, LCM is to pass and enact our MOF files. It also determines our refresh mode, whether we're in push or pull mode. And there are many other LCM settings that you can configure. A couple I want to mention here is uh, reboot node if needed. If you apply a configuration and something that you change using that configuration requires a reboot, you can tell the LCM to go ahead and reboot that node whenever, whenever it's needed. I probably uh, recommend that for installing our SQL Server. I would probably disable that once it's in production because I don't want to accidentally apply a configuration that needs a reboot and then suddenly uh, my prod server's rebooted in the middle of the day. <laughs> 
Some of the other ones on here are the refresh mode, as I mentioned, the refresh frequency minutes is how many is how often the LCM will check with a pool server uh, for updated configurations. The other one I'll mention is configuration mode. Uh, there's three options for this apply only, which means make it so apply and monitor, which means it'll make it so, but then it will check whether there's been any configuration drift and report back or apply and autocorrect. So if your server moves out of the desired state, do you want the LCM to automatically correct that? The LCM will be configured using a meta configuration, which is gonna look a lot like the configurations we've already written. So let's take a look at some current settings. I'm just gonna select uh, three settings from the many that are available on the LCM, or four settings, sorry. You can see that the action after reboot will be to continue configuration. We're in the push refresh mode. Configuration mode frequency minutes is 15. And we currently don't have a source path set up for resources. The, the source path uh, is where your target node can go to get any resources that it needs to, to be able to uh, enact that configuration. So all of the resources that are in the configuration need to be available on both your target node and your authoring station. So here's my meta configuration. I'm targeting a certain node with uh, four settings here. I'm updating configuration mode frequency minutes to 20. And I'm adding that resource uh, file share in for my resources. I'll then call my LCM config uh, meta configuration. And you can see DSC server 2 metamorph has been created. And then I'll use set DSC local configuration manager from that output path targeting DSC server 2 to configure that. And if I check my settings, you can see this has been updated from 15 to 20, and I now have my resource share set up. The final step in our kind of pipeline for DSC was the monitoring phase. Uh, that is kind of out of scope for today's presentation, but I just wanted to make you aware of some, com uh, some commands and some functions that you can use uh, to investigate once you've got this set up. DSC also writes to the Windows event logs, and those are under application and services logs, Microsoft Windows desired state configuration. Uh, the first two are enabled by default. If you need extra um, information for debugging, you can turn on two additional uh, logs for DSC. Cool, so that was our whistle stop tour of DSC. Uh, hopefully we all have a baseline understanding now. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions as we go. I should have probably said that uh, 25 minutes ago. But now we're going to get into uh, DSC for, SQL, for installing SQL Server. So I'm a database engineer, and people will come to me all the time and say, hey, I've got a new project. I've got this application that needs a SQL Server. And I'll pull out my checklist, right? Because I want to make sure when I'm installing SQL Server that they all are configured in the way that I've decided. So you can see I've got several steps here. Perhaps I need to install some Windows features. I need to create my directories. I need to install SQL. I need to enable TCP IP and set up the firewall so we can connect remotely. And then I've got some configuration settings and finally a database I want to create. So what I need to do is I need to take this list and I need to map it to DSC resources. And that's what I've done here on this slide. So install Windows features and create directories. We can use the built-in uh, resources from PS Desired State Configuration, Windows Feature and File. To install SQL Server, I'll need to bring in the SQL Server DSC module for the SQL setup resource. You can see on step five, though, it's not always, there's not always just one resource for the job. To enable the firewall, I can either use the SQL Server DSC SQL Windows firewall resource, which will specifically consider, yeah, specifically configure the firewall for SQL Server, or I can use the networking DSC firewall resource, which gives me a much more granular control. Finally, the configuration and then the database uh, that I want to create. So let's do it. Let's go install SQL Server. So what I'm going to do here is pull up my install SQL Server configuration. And I'm going to go ahead and show you that there are no currently no SQL servers. There are no SQL services currently running on that box. Uh, I want to make sure you see that this is happening during the session. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this uh, and we'll go through it while, that, while it's installing. I should get a pop-up in just a second for my password, which I'll put in. And that'll start going off and configuring my SQL Server for me. 
So let's go ahead, let's take a look uh, at the different pieces. So first of all, my moth file, DSC server two. This is gonna look pretty similar to what you've already seen. I'm creating some directories using my composite resource. But the thing I really wanna show is this. This is my SA password. It's saved as a credential, but it is in clear text in my moth file. It is really important that if you're going to use DSC in your production environments, that you use a, to use a certificate to encrypt your MOF files. Um, I did have to jump through some hoops to be allowed to put the plain text password in here, which I'll show you in a second. But it is something to remember that this MOF file is not just on my target node. It is, it, sorry, it's not just on my authoring station. It's been delivered to my target node. Uh, and that is going to sit in a folder on my target node. So it does need to be encrypted. So let's take a look at the config file. This is our configuration data, right? That we have passed through uh, into my configuration. I've got two nodes defined. We're actually only gonna build one DSC server two. Here you can see I've got node name asterisk, which means applies to all nodes. PS DSC allow plain text passwords. This is the hoop you have to jump through to be able to have that plain text password in your MOF file. If you try and run a configuration that doesn't have that certificate set up, Without that uh, switch on, it'll be like, whoa, what are you doing? We can't have plain text passwords. Uh, so it does know that it does make you jump through a hoop and acknowledge that. Then if I come down here, I've got my non-node data and I've got this set up in two ways so I can show you that it can be used in different ways. Firstly, I've got my directories and these are just kind of keys under my non-node data for different files. But then I have a config options hash table that is nested in this non-node data. Uh, with several settings that I want to set, backup compression, cost threshold, max degree of parallelism, any, anything else, this is all for SP configure, um, different things that I've wanted to set. But that's my configuration data, and that's been passed into this configuration, import SQL Server. As you can see, I've pulled in three different modules to use the resources. This was the pop-up you saw for me getting my SA password. This can be done in different ways. Just for today, I'm using uh, get credential. And then I'm going to loop through my nodes. And for all nodes, these resources are going to be added. I have commented out the Windows feature. I don't need it for this uh, version. And it just adds a, a minute or so to the installation. Here I've got my JP SQL folder structure, which is that call to the composite resource that we already built earlier on. And here I'm defining all of the folders I want to create for my installation. I've then got the SQL setup resource and this is all of the properties um, that will get passed through to the SQL setup and you can actually see it down here uh, if you can read this yellow text this is the actual uh, command that's being passed through to install SQL Server. I'm adding a SQL sysadmin account just the SQL engine features all of the folders security mode is SQL uh, which is uh, mixed mode authentication and my SA password. Enabling TCP IP Here's the allow firewall using the SQL Windows firewall to allow that uh, hole in the firewall to connect remotely. And now I've got my uh, just a different way of using my configuration data. In this example, I'm actually looping through using for each on all of the config options. And for each config option in that hash table, I'm creating a SQL configuration resource block uh, with just set config option and the name, and then pulling through the name and the settings right here. Finally, I'm creating my DBA database using the SQL database resource. Um, and that's the end of my configuration. The only things I did after that was call the configuration uh, using the configuration data and then start DSC configuration using wait verbose. Uh, so I get this uh, output on the screen instead of if it going into a SQL job. Couple of things to note here. There is a depends on uh, property in all resources. And what that does is says, don't bother creating the database until SQL setup install SQL has run successfully. If my install fails, there's no point trying to create a database, right? Because it's it's not there yet. So that is uh, a way of controlling the kind of uh, flow of DSC. We already mentioned the SA password and then PSDSC run as credential is another property you can add to be able to run those resources under different accounts. Now, as you can see, it started to uh, get past the actual installation piece and is now working on the rest of the configurations, right? That TCP IP, uh, opening the uh, Windows firewall, 
our configuration settings and our install or creating our database. So we should in a second be able to connect to this SQL server. Cool. So it has taken 10 minutes to install that SQL server. It usually takes around six or seven uh, without the recording running. So if we come over here to uh, DSC, uh, sorry, to Azure Data Studio, and I connect this to my DSC server two, I've now connected to my database. Let's go ahead and configure uh, SP configure to show advanced options and check our cost threshold for parallelism. It's currently set at 25, and you can see my DBA database was created successfully as well. So that was pretty cool, right? We've created exactly the same SQL Server every time in 10 minutes or less. So what happens when we want to make a change to this configuration? Now, there are two places where we might want to make a change, right? The first is our configuration data. If, for example, I've been reading some blog posts on the internet and I read that it's a really good idea to turn this into 500. It's not. This is not a performance tuning session. I'm just giving you an example of how you can change a setting. Uh, you should change that to whatever you think is most applicable to your environment. But anyway, I've updated my configuration data to 500. And you'll notice that this little blue bo uh, blob has appeared. That's because it's checked into source control. So it wants me to commit this message, write in why I've changed that. And that will be recorded to me personally making that change, which is another benefit of having this in source control. I can also add in more resource blocks if I want. If I wanted to add another database, perhaps a PowerShell database. I need to create a unique name for my resource, and then I've called my database PowerShell. What I'll do now is I need to rerun the whole configuration because I've edited the resources in it. But the configuration data that I updated will also be pulled in. I run this whole thing. I should actually get a prompt for that password again because of how I've written this configuration. It's not going to need that password. There you can see it's running through the DSC output again. It's created the two moth files, and now it's going to go through and it's going to check every resource. Am I in the desired state? If it is in the desired state, it will just carry on. It doesn't need to do anything. If that test fails, it'll run the set piece of the module of the set piece of the resource to make it so and put it in the desired state. And you can see as it goes through here, it will go to the install SQL. Obviously, it will check that this in SQL is installed, see that it's installed, and not need to rerun that installation. So if I come back over here and I recheck this, you can see my configuration value is now at 500. And if I refresh this, I've got my second database. So that was how to install and configure SQL Server uh, with DSC. We then made a simple change and showed that that incremental change can be applied to our SQL Server. So next steps. My first recommendation once you've got your DSC stuff up and running is to get it into source control. It is really valuable to have that in source control and to be able to uh, commit any changes with really good commit messages showing exactly what happened in the history of your SQL Server. You can then take that and build into a CI pipeline so you can deploy those changes automatically into your environments. You can also look at pool servers, right? We talked about that um, to be able to deploy your configurations to a pool server and then have your nodes pull that down. Another option in that realm is to look at Azure automation. A couple of other things to mention that you could look into is the third party integration. DSC uh, integrates really nicely with Chef, Puppet, Ansible, and some other uh, configuration management tools. Uh, there is a module called Datum, which builds on the idea of having composite resources and, and breaking our configuration down into manageable chunks. Uh, there's also a link on that slide to DSC Workshop, which is a really good implementation of that. What's next for DSC? So DSC has been ar around for a while, and it will be con it will continue to be around in the future. PowerShell 7 uh, is going to have DSC version 3, which is going to look slightly different to PowerShell DSC that we have currently. 
the main goal is to start to make it cross-platform. It was originally built on top of WMI, which meant it could only be used for Windows. And that's not the world we're going to live in, that we're living in now. So the first step is invoke DSC resource can now be called outside of the LCM. We can run resources or we can invoke them and make uh, configuration changes without depending on that LCM. The second piece of this is to remove the dependency of MOF on MOF files. And the first step of that is to use class-based resources instead of those, those script-based resources. And perhaps in the future, there'll be no LCM and there'll be a different agent that will be used. As far as the timeline, I'm not really sure. It's on the roadmap for PowerShell, or it's on the blog post for PowerShell Team 2021 Investments. Uh, but Windows Server 2022 is out in preview and you can see uh, that the PowerShell version built into that is 5.1. And so PowerShell 5.1 does have the LCM built in. So PowerShell uh, DSC is still going to be around for a while and still useful to configure your boxes with. Hope you've enjoyed the session. If you have any questions for me, please feel free to reach out. Uh, my blog post and my GitHub link are on this slide also. There are several DSC blog posts up available on my blog already. And all of these demos and slides are available on my GitHub. Thanks again for joining me today. Hope you enjoy the rest of the summit.